Hello my amazing people and welcome back to my channel. If you're back, if you are new, welcome to my channel. I'm Shayna and I have a missing persons case for you all today. Today we will be talking about the disappearance of Melissa Trumpy. She went missing in October of 2021 so this is very recent. This case was recommended to me by one of my subscribers. Her name is Danielle. She was actually able to get me in contact with someone really close to Melissa and with that information I was able to create create this video. So this video is very special to me because I work directly with the people that are, like I said, close to Melissa. And I think that reason caused this video to hit me a little harder than other videos. I was kind of stalling recording because it is a heavy one. I'm honored that I was asked to cover Melissa's story and I'm hoping that I can help even if it's in a very small way to get her story out there and to find resolution for her and her family. Just my disclaimer, this is all information that I have gotten from family sources as well as internet sources and compiled into a video for educational purposes. Thank you so very much for joining me today and let's get started. Melissa Ann Trumpy was a 37-year-old woman living in Greene County, Wisconsin at the time of her disappearance. She had lived there her whole life and she had really deep roots in the area with most of her family and her friends all living close by. This is a very safe place to live with pretty much no crime, very little crime in her area and people who live there typically stay their entire lives. Melissa is a mother of three children. She has Mateo and Josie, who are six and eight years old, as well as Delena, who's a bit older. She's in high school. The father of the two youngest of Melissa's children is a man named Benny, who helped me put this video together for the most part for Melissa. If there's anything that you could say about Melissa is that she was a loving and caring mother. Her kids always were glued to her and she put them first in her life no matter what. Outside of being a mom, Melissa is known to be happy, outgoing, and extremely loving. Her best friend is a woman that she knew pretty much her entire life since childhood, and she actually worked for her best friend in recent years. This woman needed around-the-clock care, so Melissa decided to be her primary caregiver, given that they were already best friends and they would do anything for each other. And this role fit Melissa's personality perfectly because she was known to be, like I told you, very loving, very caring, and extremely considerate of everyone around her. Melissa's favorite holiday by far was Christmas. Every single year you could count on her to go all out with decorations and lights. She loved the spirit that the season brought and something about her just lit up around this time of year and her happiness was extremely contagious with everyone looking forward to celebrating with her, especially her children. Melissa enjoyed the thrill of riding her motorcycle both on and off road and her favorite pastime by far was shopping. She loved shopping for herself as well as her children especially and she will always keep them in the nicest clothing and she loved seeing them light up when she got them the newest toys that they wanted. She spoiled them with both love and anything that they could ask for and her free spirit made her someone that the kids and other people loved being around. Overall, Melissa had her life very well put together. She never showed interest in drugs or hung around the wrong people. And in the 11 years that she was with Benny, he never once knew her to show interest in potentially dangerous hobbies or situations or anything of the sort. Her life was her kids, her family, her friends, and her work, and she was very happy. But about a year and a half before her disappearance, Melissa became involved with a man named Derek Hammer who, let's just say, didn't have the best reputation in the area. Derek is also in his mid-30s and he's from Shannon, Illinois, which is a town of about 800 people, a very small town. But in this small town, Derek's family has a fair bit of influence. His mom actually works in the same office as the mayor and she's good friends with the mayor as well. His mom is also the town treasurer where, where they live. And his father passed away some years ago and left behind a sizable inheritance. So his mother has quite a big trust of money and influence in the area. That's very fair to say. But his mother's power did not guarantee that Derek himself would choose an upstanding life. This man has had pretty much a hand in anything crime related that you can imagine. He's had multiple charges against him over the years and he is no stranger to the system. I will give you a list and this is not everything 
but this is quite a bit in and of itself, a list of the charges against him over the years. In Wisconsin, he has bail jumping charges, charges for eluding an officer, disorderly conduct, domestic abuse, possession of a firearm, drug trafficking, cocaine possession with intent to distribute, THC possession with intent to distribute. He had a marijuana growth operation in his house, malicious destruction of property as well. In Nevada, he has battery charges, coercion charges, battery constituting domestic violence, and strangulation charges, okay? So this man is no stranger to the system. In addition to all of that, if that's not enough for you, he also has, this is insane, IED explosive charges, kidnapping, unlawful discharge of a firearm for firing at one of his ex-girlfriends while she was running away from him. So his history with, with crime, it goes pretty deep. It is not surface level, it's fair to say that. And also, it's important to know that anytime police are called out to his house, an entire SWAT team has to come. Like military grade vehicles and gear and like it's it's crazy the regular police can't just show up if there's a call where he's on the scene an entire SWAT team has to show up that is the level of danger that this man presents to society as well as police themselves someone with these types of charges we would expect to be behind bars that would make most of us feel comfortable but there is this miraculous pattern with Derek where he will be charged with something and then bonded out of jail time and time and time again. It happens like clockwork and it's quite concerning because he is out walking around on the streets or has been walking around on the streets after facing some serious charges that most people would rot in jail for. There are people who strongly feel that Derek's mother's connections, power, money, and influence are the reasons that he continuously gets bonded out of jail and is offered this uncanny leniency every time he does something illegal. So it's resulted in this continuous cycle of bad behavior, arrest, release, and then again, bad behavior, arrest, release over and over and over again. Literally, it's been a pattern over the years up until this point. So now that you know a little bit about who Derek Hammer is, it might put in perspective for you how a relationship between him and Melissa could take a turn for the worst relatively quickly. She fell for him pretty fast and I just want to, before I continue, make it very clear, it's none of our place to judge anyone who decides to date someone for whatever reasons that they have. I'm pretty sure we've all made decisions in our life that to other people, they might not be able to fully understand why. So I just want to make sure everyone knows that it is not in our position to cast judgment on Melissa for her decisions, and I don't want to see any comments that are even remotely hinting at that. Okay, just want to make sure I, I say that before I continue. Melissa and Derek met through mutual friends and she actually took an interest in Derek while she was still living in the same house with Benny. But as she started this relationship with Derek, Benny noticed changes in her. He could tell that she started using drugs that she had never used before and she just started to change her behavior in different ways. Sometimes she wouldn't come home or when she would come home, Benny could tell she had been on substances that he had never seen her use before. And Benny knew it, underneath all of this was influence of Derek because the second that Melissa got involved with Derek, everything everything shifted and Benny was worried for her safety he was worried you know that she was making a decision to be with someone who wasn't the best fit and he insisted to her maybe you should wait longer before you decide to date and maybe you'll eventually see that this probably isn't the right person for you but he could tell that Melissa had fallen for Derek relatively quickly. The first time that Benny actually met Derek, he could tell that something was off with him. You ever meet someone and there's like a disconnect with them? You can't tell exactly what it is, but you just look at them and you can tell that there's something missing there. There's this like darkness about them. That is what Benny felt and he knew, like he just had this gut feeling about Derek and he did not like the idea of Melissa being with him at all. Melissa's family didn't have the best impression of Derek when they met him either and they 
could tell that he had controlling behavior and they could tell that the relationship with him was changing who Melissa was, the way that she acted. And they noticed this distance that started to form between the family and Melissa. And it was all at the hands of Derek and it was blatantly obvious that the relationship that he was cultivating with Melissa was one where it was all about him, it was all about control. There wasn't room for, there wasn't as much room for family and the other things that Melissa enjoyed doing. So her family could tell something wasn't quite right. And Melissa's children also, at their young ages, did not get the best impression from Derek. They could tell that something wasn't healthy in this relationship dynamic. Melissa will always assure her loved ones that things weren't as bad as everyone thought they were. And she would try to find ways to defend Derek or she would deny that anything was wrong altogether when the family would voice their concerns about him. There were changes in her, like I told you guys, you know, though, that the family could tell. Her physical appearance started to change, her weight changed, she didn't seem as happy anymore. So there was one day that Benny saw a picture of his house and he saw in the photo that Derek's car was parked in the driveway. Remember, Melissa and Benny were still living together at this point. And as you may imagine, Benny was infuriated. He was concerned about Derek's dangerous behavior and he didn't like the idea of Derek being in close proximity to his house or his children, whether Melissa decided to date him or not. When Benny saw this picture, he absolutely lost his temper and he decided to make his way over to Derek's house where he lived in Illinois. He contemplated what he wanted to do and then in that moment, he just made the decision. He drove full speed into Derek's house, okay? This happened in 2019. So after driving his vehicle full speed into Derek's home, Benny had to serve some probation. Nobody was hurt. But Benny actually told me that he never felt any regret for this decision that he made. He didn't like Derek. He didn't want Derek to have control over Melissa and he wanted Derek to stay away. And after this situation actually happened, there were drugs found in Derek's home. Um, but of course, Derek only served a few months before getting bailed out yet again. Now, when Derek got bailed out this time, Melissa continued to see him and everyone continued to see the changes in her. But no matter what anyone would say, she decided to stay with him. She was in love with him. And whether it was a conscious choice because of love or she was coerced to stay and made to feel like she couldn't leave, that there was a more of a risk of her leaving, a risk to her life and her safety, we don't know what the actual reason was, but she did remain in this relationship with Derek. Benny had gotten to a point where he decided that it was best for him to move out of the house and literally within months, you guys, Derek had convinced Melissa to let him move in. So now living under this roof was Melissa, Derek, and the children. And the main concern was of course him being around the kids. As far as I am aware, he never did anything to the children. But still, the idea of this man with this record and this history that was very extensive made everyone kind of feel uneasy with him being in the same household as the children. Everyone knew what kind of person he was and they definitely felt less than comfortable with the living situation now. Leading up to Melissa's disappearance, a series of events took place that are quite troubling, so I decided that it's best to break them all down for you now. One month before the day Melissa went missing, her son actually made a shocking confession to one of his teachers at school. Little Mateo went to school and he told his teacher that his mom and her boyfriend had gotten into a big fight the night before and that this fight had escalated. It was a big blow up. Um, Derek actually put his hands on Melissa and actually pointed a shotgun at Melissa in front of little Mateo. He saw this entire thing take place. And of course, with the shocking information, the school decided to contact police as well as Child Protective Services. Just two days later on September 13, 2021, SWAT teams from six different jurisdictions, you guys, I mean, this is a full crew. Remember, I told you when there are any calls about Derek Hammer, the police can't just show up. The SWAT team has to show up. So six different jurisdictions, SWAT teams showed up to this house and they actually found the shotgun that Mateo told his teacher about and they found two pistols as well. In addition to this, they found weed and cocaine inside of the home. Derek was charged with possession of firearms, domestic and disorderly conduct, and both Derek and Melissa got drug charges and child endangerment charges. The children were placed in their father's custody at this time. Now this raid took place because of what was reported to police and CPS. And as you may imagine, Melissa was absolutely devastated. These were the first charges that were ever 
against her. She had never been involved with the law in any sort of way. So this was just like a shock to the system for her. And everyone could tell and everyone was so upset in her life because they knew that this wasn't Melissa. They knew that this was all about control, that Melissa was in the situation because of the coercion that Derek had done to her. And because of the in the situation that Melissa was in at the hands of Derek. This wasn't a situation that Melissa just got herself into willy-nilly. She was devastated. And I want to really put in perspective for you guys, at this point in the relationship, Melissa was afraid. She couldn't just up and leave. And if you do your research, you will learn that women in domestic violence situations are at the highest risk when they try to leave. It's very common where you get trapped in a relationship with an abuser and you literally cannot get out for fear of your safety being jeopardized. But after both of their arrests, Melissa was released and Derek, of course, was released shortly thereafter on a $10,000 cash bond. After this point, he moved in with his mother in Shannon, Illinois. There was a no contact order in place and Derek and Melissa were not to have any correspondence whatsoever with one another. So Melissa is living in Wisconsin and Derek is living back where he used to live with his mother and Shannon. Melissa decided after this huge blow up that she did not want to live her life like this anymore, you guys. She was tired of living in constant fear. She was tired of having to look over her shoulder due to him living below the law. She hated the idea of not being around for her children if she made the decision to stay in a relationship with him. She was just having this kind of epiphany where she was like, I can't continue down this road because there is no happy ending here. To make things even more annoying than they already were at this point, Derek stole multiple cars after getting released, including Melissa's car. He got into a high speed chase with the police and blew the motor on the car. So on top of everything that Melissa was already dealing with, now she didn't have her own vehicle because Derek stole it and got in a high speed chase. He didn't get caught from this chase because police actually had to call it off because it was in an area, I think near a school where it was unsafe for them to continue, to continue the pursuit. But he was involved in the high speed chase and now Melissa was short a vehicle. Now Melissa was released, but of course she was still having to deal with the charges that were brought against her in September. And there was correspondence with police and, and court dates that were included in this. And police, had charges against Melissa, but they knew that the person that they really wanted to crack down on was Derek and their plan for getting answers about Derek and getting something incriminating against him was going to be to get it through Melissa. Up until this point, Melissa had refused to tell police anything about Derek. I don't know if it's because, you know, just that she loved him or if she was concerned for her safety, probably a little bit of both, but she hadn't flipped on Derek up until this point. Anytime the police tried to get information, she was not willing to talk. She actually had a court appearance on October 25th, after which she was approached again by the police and taken in for questioning. Her mother was with her during this entire time where police talked to her for two hours and going into this questioning, she knew that they would try to get more information about Derek because that's what they had been primarily focusing on up until this point. For about two weeks, they had been kind of putting the pressure on her. Melissa was hesitant for most of the questioning. She would answer general questions or questions about herself, but whenever police would graze the topic of Derek, she was shut down. She wasn't willing to say anything incriminating against him in this questioning that was for about two hours. She was staying firm in her refusal to speak all the way up until the point that police threatened her by saying that if she didn't flip on Derek, her kids would be taken away that day and she would be put in a jail cell that night. Hesitantly, Melissa did decide to provide them with some information about Derek. She had kind of just been pushed to her limit with this questioning and having to live with the threat of Derek over her head for the last month. She was just like past the point of fear. She was just like, I just want to tell you guys whatever you're asking me so I can go. She wanted to be free. She wanted to move on with her life and she wanted to focus on being a mother and a caregiver and her tunnel vision was on her kids at this point because she just couldn't live with the idea of her kids being taken away from her. After the court appearance and subsequent questioning that Melissa underwent, Derek of course was on high alert. He wanted to know whatever Melissa had told the police and he eagerly wanted to know if they had actually gotten her to flip on him. 
he had to make sure above all else that Melissa didn't tell them anything that would be against him. So he was blowing up her friend's phones that day, seeing if any of them were willing to give him information about what happened in court. Melissa's friends knew that Derek would lose his mind if he knew the truth of what actually happened and Melissa telling police information that day. So her friends decided to tell him when he was calling them that Melissa was placed in jail that night, even though she wasn't. Their intention behind this was to buy some time. They knew that if Derek thought Melissa was in jail, then he would infer that she didn't flip on him and he would relax for a little bit. So they told him this in an effort to try to protect her from Derek, to try to buy some time. But Melissa decided not to go along with the story that her friends had told Derek and she actually contacted him herself that night to tell him that she wasn't in jail and that the next time she saw him, she would tell him everything that happened that day. The very next day on October 26th, Melissa went to her best friend's house for work. And this entire day, Melissa had been receiving calls and texts from Derek and someone very close to Derek that I will keep unnamed, but this other person is very close to Derek. We're just gonna call him Joe, but his name is not actually Joe. So Derek and Joe were texting Melissa pretty much that entire day, trying to convince her to come visit them in Illinois. Melissa told her best friend about what was happening and she let her friend know that she was feeling nervous about it, that something didn't feel right about them texting her, wanting her to come to Shannon. But she decided that she was going to head that direction after finishing work and she drove from her friend's house in Wisconsin in the rental that she had since her car was broken by Derek that night. At 10.30 p.m. that night, she headed toward Shannon where Derek was staying. Her friend was very concerned about her. Melissa was clearly anxious, like I said. She, on top of that, had a black eye and her face was swollen and injured and bruised. She didn't look like herself and there was no question of how she got the injuries. It's eerie because we know that after she says goodbye to her best friend, Melissa would never be seen again. The rental truck that she had was found abandoned the very next day on Bolton Road, which is a road that's outside the normal route Melissa would have taken to see Derek and Shannon. And ironically, Derek was actually arrested the same day, but he was arrested for charges unrelated to Melissa. This arrest was for warrants from Wisconsin for bail jumping, auto theft, and domestic battery, as well as fleeing and eluding. Um, but Melissa's family had no idea at this point that she actually was missing since it all happened within, within one day. But by the very next day, October 28th, her family grew concerned enough that they decided to report her missing. She hadn't reached out to speak to anyone and that wasn't normal for her. And everyone was already on high alert because they knew that Melissa had flipped on Derek to the police. In their hearts, everyone had this sinking feeling that something might have happened to Melissa and that her being unreachable was because Derek had found out that she told police the truth. And they didn't think that her not getting back to them by the 28th was a coincidence. Derek denied any knowledge of what happened to Melissa. He retained a lawyer and has not spoken about Melissa's disappearance at all. Melissa's family tried to tell police that they knew Derek had to have something to do with this. And when I'm saying Melissa's family, I'm talking about her family, of course. I'm also talking about Benny, her friends. I'm just talking about everyone close to Melissa, just for clarification, um, when I'm saying her family. But her family tried to insist to police that Derek had to have something to do with this. They knew it in their hearts and they were terrified that their worst nightmare was coming true. That what they had been worried about for all this time, for the year and a half that Melissa was with Derek was coming true, that he had done something to her. Involved in her disappearance was the FBI, the Illinois State Police, Carroll County, Stevenson County, and Greene County Sheriff's offices. So there were quite a few forces involved here but Carroll County is where Shannon is located which is Derek's mother's home so that is where you would consider consider like the epicenter of the investigation they were leading the investigation and it is alleged that they have been extremely unhelpful dismissive and rude to Melissa's family since all of this took place the family has said that Carroll County won't take their phone calls and when they just leave them voicemails because they're not answering, no one ever calls them back. People in the community have come to Melissa's family and told them that they've tried to call the police and give them tips and information that they think that they have and they were met with laughter from the police. This is what people are saying. It's all alleged, but 
what reason would people have to really lie about that? People are saying that police are laughing them off the phone or they're telling them that they don't need any more tips because all the information that they have is good enough, which obviously cannot be true because Melissa is still missing. So that might put in perspective what the family feels like they are up against right now. And that's why I'm hoping that this story can really help spread some awareness and get the message out there. Um, so moving on, I will go over what we know so far as far as the investigation goes. And just so I can be very clear about this, what we know so far is because of what the family has done. They have basically been their own detectives in this case. It's not because of the actual police work that's happening here. I just want to make that very clear to you guys. The family has used text messages, social media messages, GPS locations, and witness accounts. They've gotten all of this on their own to piece together their own timeline. The only information police were able to find out is that Melissa was last seen the day that we know she was okay after she left her friend's house. She was seen at Derek's mother's house in Shannon around midnight. They have no suspects named, but according to them, they are still investigating. Searches have been conducted, focusing on Shannon as well as the area that the rental truck was found. Basically, the searches have been mostly led by Melissa's family, those close to her. And her sister, Mandy, has been very outspoken doing interviews, and Benny has also participated in interviews and spreading awareness. There are Facebook pages as well where people are trying to rally together to do searches, spread the word, get more information out there or get information from people. And they're just trying to be very vocal to get Melissa's name out there. They know that the more people who hear about her case, the better chance of a resolution and bringing her home. It's just hard for the family because they really feel like in large part they're working alone and that the police are watching them work instead of working alongside them. And in their opinion, they really feel like people in the neighborhood know information, but some people are just too afraid to come forward. So they've decided to do some digging of their own and it's led to a few very key important discoveries that piece together some sort of timeline of the night that Melissa disappeared. So I told you that Melissa's car was found on the side of the road the day after she was last seen, before Melissa was even determined to be a missing person. Her car was abandoned and found on the side of the road. All of her personal items were found in this vehicle, you guys. Her cards, her cash, her coat, and even her shoes. Everything was in the car and the family's convinced that Melissa didn't drive the car there and leave it there. It wouldn't make sense. She had no reason to be traveling in this area at all. And ironically, ironically, listen to this, the location of the car is within walking distance from where Derek's dad died in a hit and run for which Derek was questioned about back in 2008. Okay, so Derek's dad, just to give you some clarity, Derek's dad was killed back in 2008 via hit and run. Someone ran him over with a car and fled the scene. This location of where this happened to his father is within a short walking distance to where Melissa's car, rental car, was abandoned. When her, his dad died, Derek was actually questioned multiple times for this and there are people in the community who say that they saw Derek hit his dad and leave the scene. That's all alleged, everyone is innocent until proven guilty, but it's a very small town and people in this town talk, okay? Very small town, like I told you, Shannon, it's a population of less than a thousand people. Do you know how small that is? That's smaller than some high schools. It's a very small town. So her car being found in this location in such close proximity to where this other unfortunate event took place that Derek is alleged to have been involved in made everyone shudder. So there are houses on this road and Melissa's family thought that it would be a smart idea to go and speak to the homeowners on this road because a few of them, I don't know if it's one or two or three, but there is at least one house with ring doorbell camera footage. They have a ring doorbell camera and they knew that, you know, this, this camera could have possibly picked up who drove the vehicle there or if there was someone following behind the vehicle. They, it could have just given them some sort of information to paint a picture of what happened before the car was left there. So the family went out, talked to a couple of the people, and they found out from the homeowners of the people who actually had the ring camera that police hadn't come out at all. They hadn't come out at all to see if they could get this camera footage, if they could look at it or if they could confiscate it to use as part of the investigation. And the, the family's like, if you, can't at least, if you can't do that, then 
what are you doing exactly? Like what kind of investigation can you possibly be doing if you didn't even think to do that and we are doing it? So long story short, the family believes that Derek planted the car there, Melissa's rental truck. Uh, Melissa wouldn't have been on this road in the first place, but she definitely wouldn't have abandoned the rental there and then left with no cash, no cards, no jacket in the middle of October on foot. It truly doesn't look like Melissa left this car there. Now, of course, phone locations are very commonly used in missing persons cases because all of us keep our phone on our hip at all times. So her family decided to get her last locations to see kind of where she traveled the night she went missing. And they noticed that when they went to go pick up her travel history, her phone was pinging in different states and in different countries, okay? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with what a VPN is, but a VPN, essentially, one of the things that it can do is hide your location. So it appeared that a VPN had been installed on her phone making her look like she was in one place when she was actually in another. Now, who else would install a VPN on Melissa's phone other than a known criminal? We don't know for sure that Derek did this, but the family's like, w w why would Melissa want a VPN on her phone? She wouldn't. They're there's absolutely no reason for her to have downloaded this on her phone herself. But it was discovered that Melissa's last whereabouts probably weren't in Shannon at Derek's mom's house, like the police said at all. So the family is doing some digging, they're talking to people, they're trying to see what people are willing to tell them. And they're actually told by people that Melissa was seen at an apartment complex about 16 miles away from Shannon the same night. Now, who lives in this apartment complex? Remember I told you that there's someone very close to Derek who was also insisting that Melissa come out to Shannon. I think I called him Joe. This man lives in this apartment complex and according to at least two of the residents, Melissa entered the apartment that night but was never seen leaving. The family has found messages between him and Melissa. They knew each other. They had correspondence back and forth. Now this part made me feel really uneasy, okay? It's also alleged that in the days after Melissa went missing, Joe ripped up portions of his linoleum floor in his apartment. It's alleged that people saw him taking out pieces of the floor and it's also alleged that he repainted his apartment as well in the days after Melissa went missing. Now, I don't know about you. In my apartment, if I need something done, I'm contacting the leasing office or my landlord. Most people aren't renovating apartments because they don't own the apartment. Now, and also, this apartment complex is known to be pretty run down. It's not known to be the best area. The best people don't hang out in this area. It's not a place where you would move and be like, yeah, I'm looking forward to renovating this place. We're gonna make it really nice. It's a come and go kind of place. So for him to be repainting and ripping up the linoleum, when the family was told this by people who lived there, they were like, that's very important to know. In addition to this, witnesses also told the family that they saw two vehicles speeding out of the parking lot that same night. I mean, ripping out of the parking lot at full speed. And all of this information is just people who have been willing to talk to those close to Melissa. There are people who are afraid to speak to the authorities, but they will talk to other people who aren't police. It's That's a very common thing where individuals may feel more comfortable just speaking directly to family because they don't want to get involved with the police, right? That's a very common thing. But of course, Melissa's family took all of this information and hauled it right to the police so that the police could do some digging of their own, start a real investigation, maybe go get some forensics, some DNA from the scene, try to piece together if this is really where Melissa was. But up until this point, as far as I'm aware, police still have not searched this area for evidence. Joe has made a really big effort to distance himself from the investigation since Melissa went missing. He has claimed that he wasn't close to Melissa at all, that he hadn't seen her in months. But we know that that's not true. There are many people who have said that they were seen together recently and Melissa's family literally saw the messages between Jill and Melissa proving that they knew each other. And there are multiple scenarios that can place him in close proximity to Melissa before she went missing. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of his correspondence with Melissa before she went missing was him encouraging her to come out to Shannon. So I told you Derek was encouraging her to come out to Shannon 
and also Joe was encouraging her to come out to Shannon and he was encouraging her under the guise of safety, right? Come out, be with me. I'll keep you away from Derek. I'll protect you. Derek was also trying to convince her to come out to Shannon for we don't know what reason, his own special reasons. But given that Joe is close to Derek, when I tell you that they are really close, they are close. Given that they are such tight people, it has many people wondering if both Joe and Derek know what happened to Melissa that night. There have been no suspects named in this case, but in the court of public opinion, Derek Hammer should be the primary suspect. It's important to note that in the mugshot taken of Derek when he was arrested the day after Melissa went missing, he has very recent injuries on his face, right? Very clearly recently gotten scratches on his face and it struck a lot of people as odd. So the entire left side of his face is scratched and he has a tower, towel over his left shoulder in the mugshot, which strikes a lot of people as looking as though maybe he got into some sort of alter altercation before his arrest. It makes you think that he definitely did have something to do with Melissa's disappearance before he was arrested the next day. After seeing this mugshot, Melissa's sister told a news station that she was, quote, glad her sister didn't go down without a fight, end quote. The injuries are eerie because they look like something you would get from someone defending themselves against you, right? It, and it's very hard to think about. This may be the, the evidence that Melissa left on him when he made her disappear. But what's especially frustrating is his unwillingness to, to even give the smallest bit of detail from from when he last saw Melissa. If he is innocent, he should at least be willing to tell police about their last encounter. Of course, they had a no contact order, but he's already in prison. He's locked up for a slew of other charges. So the least he could do is tell police when he last saw Melissa, maybe tell them which direction she headed after he saw her or where she said she was going after he saw her. Witnesses saw Melissa at his mother's house that night before she left and ended up at this other person's house allegedly who again is close to Derek so Derek has to know what happened there is absolutely no way he doesn't know anything and he's been very smug about the entire situation since his arrest he's had zoom hearings and you can tell in the footage that he just doesn't care much at all for the situation he looks like he feels like he has better places to be and he couldn't care less about any of this. And a concern that I have is if this man is released again, is it possible that he could try to hurt someone else? Someone close to Melissa who has been speaking out against him? That worries me. We know that unfortunately after this amount of time, the outcome for a missing person is likely a grim one, but the family still wants some sort of closure. They wanna know what happened. They don't like the narrative that people on Derek's side are pushing that she just ran off and she just decided to, to disappear on her own. If that were the case, it's immediately completely discredited by the fact that she doesn't have any means of buying things for herself, of transportation. She left without her shoes. There's absolutely no way. There's no way she would have just, just left on, on her own. and. It's hard to think about because we know what likely outcomes happen in these sorts of cases. Melissa's children spent their very first Christmas without their mom this past year, and the empty space where she would have been was felt by everyone. She was the definition of Christmas cheer, and her youngest daughter even wrote to Santa that the only thing, the main thing she wanted for Christmas was for her mom to come home. While two of them are very young, they are aware of what's happening and the oldest is aware as well and she wants to help bring her mom home. Melissa's disappearance has caused a deep wound in the family but everyone is working very hard to find her and the children are working through this, this loss and processing everything with the help of therapy. Melissa's oldest daughter is in high school and I actually had the honor of speaking with her in preparation for this video. And I will be totally honest, reading about what she had to say about her mom was the hardest part. I'm going to try really hard not to tear up, but that was the hardest part by far of piecing together this video. And I do want to tell you about her thoughts a little bit. Her name is Delena and she remembers how exciting life was with her mom. She says Melissa would always cook a feast for 20 people, even though there were only five of them in the house. And she admired how hardworking her mom was. And she saw that Melissa always gave her all so that she could give her children everything that they wanted. Delena says that Melissa would break out and dance and go out of her way to make everyone laugh and smile. And she remembers Melissa cuddling her and her siblings or saying something funny when they were sad. 
Melissa was a relatable mom too and she made efforts to communicate in a healthy way with her children and she made them feel heard and respected. Delena has told me that her mom going missing has been very hard on her. This limbo is hard enough and she worries that she may feel even worse when there is finally an answer, when Melissa is finally found. She says that she hates that she never got the chance to say goodbye and that she often thinks about the last conversations they had. At the time, she had no idea that she would lose her favorite person in the world. Speaking to Delena was absolutely earth shattering for me, you guys. Like I, I just, I'm, I'm, I tried to put myself in the shoes of the people that I'm speaking with and interacting with and I think knowing my perspective as a high schooler and just the thought of going through something like this as a high schooler, how that would affect me. It was very important for me to tell you guys what, what she's feeling, what she's going through. You know, she's an incredible girl. She's an incredible girl and she is so much braver and she has so much more courage than she will ever know. If you have any information that can lead to the discovery of Melissa Trumpy's whereabouts, I will have contact information for who you can reach out to in the description box of this video. There is also a change.org petition that I will have linked down below for you all. This petition was created to try to keep Derek Hammer in jail so that he cannot cause any harm to anyone else. Melissa Trumpy is 37 years old, standing at 5 feet 10 inches tall. She's about 163 pounds with blue eyes and blonde hair. She has tattoos on her right arm and her left leg. Please spread this message so that we can do our part to get Melissa's face and name out there. I really hope that this video will be a small push in the right direction of keeping police vigilant on her case and up until this point the sad reality is that police have been actively working against Melissa's loved ones. That's just the reality of it and it seems like there's roadblocks that they have to face at every single turn. Melissa's loved ones held a candlelight. She, they actually held two candlelight vigils for her since she went missing. And at the second candlelight vigil, there was this very interesting police presence, right? Because they, they haven't answered their phones. They don't return phone calls. They are very dismissive. But when the family wanted to have a candlelight vigil, there was this sudden, very overwhelming police presence. And the police are out there as they're trying to hold the vigil. Melissa's daughter is crying and the police are telling them that they could arrest the people on the scene for impeding traffic and for demonstrating without a permit. This street that they were on, like no cars passed the entire time that they were out there for this vigil. So it was absolutely ridiculous and threatening to arrest people while Melissa's child was crying. I mean, just heartless. The family also noticed that the one establishment in Shannon, right? This is a very small town. The one establishment that exists in Shannon, Illinois, where they put up a missing persons flyer for Melissa was taken down. It's very important to remember also that if you see something or if you hear something, you say something. Even if you decide to submit information anonymously, it can still help tremendously. If anyone sees this video who was close to the investigation, who was close to the family, who may know something, who may have heard something, this is a message for you. This is a plea for you to come forward and tell people what you know. Now for my subscribers, another way that you can help, please share this video, please spread the message about Melissa. And if we can get maybe some larger channels to cover the story as well, that would be awesome. Benny mentioned to me having Kendall Ray consider covering this case would be a huge win for them because that can reach way further than I can reach, right? She's an incredible content creator and she is very respectful in her approach and she is someone that if my loved one went missing, I would want to cover their story. So I know a lot of you guys also follow Kendall Ray, um, maybe Christina Randall, but especially Kendall Ray, that was somebody that, that Benny mentioned to me. The reality is that we have so much more of a push here on YouTube than we think we do. True crime is a genre, right? And I've said this before, while it is a genre and while many people consider it to be entertainment, I personally do not look at it that way. These are real people, these are real stories, these are real families that are impacted by the individuals that we talk about on this platform. So it's important to remember that if you engage and if you consume this type of content, I feel you do have a moral responsibility to help in any way that you can. Okay, that includes spreading the message, that includes maybe donating or signing a petition, something that would take 
less than two minutes of your life. Melissa's loved ones and maybe even her children will see this video one day. So please be very mindful and respectful of your thoughts in the comment section down below. I wanna thank you guys so much for joining me today. You know what I'm gonna say. If you made it this far, you are loyal. You really are, and I appreciate you. I hope that I could help spread the message and just be a small contributing factor to bring Melissa home and finally getting answers for her family. That is all that I want from this video. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful morning or afternoon or evening, depending on what time it is when you watch this video. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. Thank you.